holding our seat so that we can get started right here at 16. We don't need to be late to the T, especially for this seminar. I don't want to be disqualified from the Women's Summit. <laughs> All right, hopefully you guys all enjoyed your last session, whether you were in here for Club Roundtable or you were over becoming a genius and golf genius. That's something I still need to learn how to do. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Erin Gainwell. I'm with the CGA, and so you are in the rule section. This is the last call. If you want to be over being a genius in the golf genius room for a golf genius advance, that's over in Gage. But we're going to get it started here with our rule. I'm really excited to introduce our two presenters, mainly because what we hang out all as Kate Moore, who is my favorite Aussie of all time. She's <laughs> our managing director of roles and competition. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get off the stage because they've got a, as you can tell with their uh, hat. Some fun stuff for you today. Thank you. Thank you, Degrenia. Isn't Erin doing an awesome job? She put this all together. If your mom is even here supporting her, then you can All right, we are going to jump right in. Uh, we had an argument in our office earlier this week as to is it easier to give a one hour rules presentation? Or is it easier to give a four hour rules presentation? Um, and we decided it's actually easier to give a four hour rules presentation. And Kate and I were dealt the hard part. So we're ready. We're going to jump right in. There's a lot to cover. Um, this is my intro slide, but Erin already introduced me. So, what you really want to know is a little bit more about who I am. Uh, this is my family. This is my husband, Corey, and my seven month old daughter, Kendall. Uh, we're trying not to develop into overbearing golf parents, um, <laughs> but as you can tell, she does own a uh, what is it, tailor-made response golf ball and a U.S. kids putter. So <laughs> we're, we're well on our way to being a little crazy, but really, we just hope she learns to love the game. Um, and a little lesser-known fact about me is that I am a state champion and national runner-up meets judger. <laughs> 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 so, you know, my hat, my hat. Um, this actually stayed in my office um, because it reminds me of all the hard work and dedication that went into learning how to do something as ridiculous as judging beef, pork, and lamb. So, um, <laughs> I did grow up in North Dakota and you need a little bit of context. Um, but if, if you need some information about the quality and the grade of those things and maybe why that is, we can chat later, um, <laughs> but that, that's not what we're here for today. So, hey, Mark, take it away. Yeah, uh, I started in 2016 with the CWGA, Colorado Women's Golf Association. CGA was nice enough to take us on. So we're still just running our women's championships. I'm super excited for this new season. I hope to see you all out there striking it down the middle. And uh, here we again. Yeah, this is uh, me. As you can tell, I do have a slight twang from the deep, deep south. That is the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, but what do you do when you're an Australian coming across to America? You bring a koala three wood head cover with you. Um, and this hat, click it once more. This is my first Akubra. This is my second Akubra that I got actually from someone in this room. So this is my second one. We're not going to cover this topic today, but I want you to look at these other two pictures. This is hole number five at Angle Sea Golf Club. Would you, while playing hole number five out there, be asking for a dangerous animal condition relief? <laughs> or would you just grab your crew from and shoo them away? <laughs> Australia's cool, you should go there. <laughs> All right, rules of golf. We're in a new cycle, 2023 new cycle this year. You will notice that the USGA, they are focusing on sustainability as we all should be. They are no longer printing the player edition. In December alone, they burned 7 million copies of the 2019 through 2022 player edition. So no more player editions. What you're going to do, you're going to get out your phone, you're going to go to your app store, and you're going to download the Rules of Golf app. Super, super helpful. It has a search feature, ladies. No more turning those pages trying to find something. <laughs> yeah. Type in Lost Ball. 
type in penalty area, it will take you to that in the app. So please go and download that app, get your ladies and your leads to download this app. All right, you also have a one pager in your packet or in your online packet. Uh, Ashley and I just put together some of the most common situations um, going 2019 outcomes versus what's happening in 2023. Uh, there is a full list of these, 16 pages long, you know, the USGA. Go to usga.org to see that full list, but we have some most common situations on a one pager there for you and how that's changed from 2019 through 2023. There really wasn't too many big changes in this new cycle. They kind of cleaned up the mistakes that they made in 2019. They're continuing to modernize. They're continuing to simplify, make it easier for players to apply the rules and to learn the rules. So they're still getting better and better, I think. All right, and today, as I said, we have to fly through this. We've got like 50 minutes. So what we're gonna do, we cannot uh, boil the ocean is a new term I learned from Ashley. The rules are massive. We can't cover anything. We acknowledge that there are a lot of ifs and buts and exceptions in the rules that we are not going to cover today. So we're going to go, which I know a lot of ladies leagues and ladies leagues love these. One kind of like the rules cards. We've got the most common situations and their solutions. So we're going to follow through this rules card for today and go more in depth into these situations that are, you've got one of those in your packet as well. You can go online, order those off our website, fantastic free look. Questions? At the end of this presentation, you can go and find the CGA staff member. We have two of them, lovely gentlemen down here, expert in the rules. We have some of our rules of gold committee here that are experts. Ashley and I are going to be on break. So go find <laughs> So if you have a question that pops up in your head while we're going through, write it down on your notes, write it down, can't find anyone but Ashley and I. Oh. <laughs> All right, Ashley, see you. All right, thank you. Um, every good rule seminar starts off with a slide that looks something like this, the principles of the game. Um, there are two main principles of the game. Um, play the course as you find it and play the ball as it flies. That's all fine and dandy, except most of the time, you can't do that. Um, so we're going to talk about what to do when you're in situations where you can't or have the option to not play your ball as it likes. Um, in this day and age, I just like to get the controversial topics out of the way. So here we go. <laughs> this is a ball in a divot in the fairway. And a lot of you feel like you should get relief in that situation. You should. Hey, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Susan feels particularly strong about that. Um, no, you're not going to get relief from that. Um, but those of you that do want to get relief from that, I understand. Um, you're just the same people that every time you hit it in the rough, you need to push it down so you have a terrible eye. <laughs> then, then, then we're talking. Um, the, the principles of the game, play the course as you find it, play the ball as it lies. Um, back, way back when, um, we used to call that rub of the green, okay? You're not always entitled to get what you think you should based on the type of shot you hit. So we got that out of the way. There's no way really you can get relief out of a divot. Um, some of you rules aficionados are going to argue me on that. Um, but principles of the game, we've covered them. It's out of the way. We're ready to go. I'm also going to take my hat off here because it's a little tight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, getting into the areas of the course. When you're applying the rules to the game of golf, when you're out there playing, it's really important that you understand where you're at, um, and more specifically, where your ball is, or where the ball, whoever you're trying to help take your lead is. Uh, that's usually one of the first questions that we ask is, well, where's the ball? Okay. So when we ask that, it gets to be very specific. This is a diagram that comes right out of rule two on your rule app. And so if you were to search areas of the course, or if you were to scroll through rule two, you would find this exact diagram. That's one thing the U.S. shaded right in the new revision is that they include a lot of pictures. Um, none of us at the CJ like to read because our executive director doesn't like to read. Um, <laughs> so pictures, pictures are, are really important. So here we go. Um, there, there are four specific areas of the course, and they're listed down here. Um, as I read them, think about what's different from two of them and the other two. Okay, the first is the teeing area, second is bunkers, 
penalty areas, and then the putting green. Does anyone have anything that's different about two of those words than the others? Yeah, it's hard to hear you up here, but here's the difference. The. The. The word, the, is very important in the rules of golf. Okay? When we say the word the, anytime in the rules book, it's the, the, whatever you want to say. Okay? It's referring to that area on the hole that you are playing. Okay? So, the teeing area, the teeing area is the teeing area that you are playing on the hole you're on. Okay? Same with the putting green. You're playing hole one. We're not talking about the putting green on hole two and hole nine. But in bunkers and penalty areas, we are. Because it doesn't say that. Okay? So here's your first quiz. This requires some participation. I wore a silly hat. You can answer my questions. Okay? <laughs> is the rough? Or I, I forgot to give you the answer. Okay. Everything else is called the general area. Okay, so this is a general area quiz. Is the rough part of the general area? Is the fairway part of the general area? Is a bunker part of the general area? Oh, yes. Is call native grass that's not marked as a penalty area part of the general area? Yes. Okay. I would give you guys like a 98%. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Okay, we've set the stage. We got to move up. If you look at the rules card that I believe is in your packet today, um, for those of you online, we can get you that information. You can purchase them on our website for your link. But the first thing there is admiral of course conditions. Um, this is in no particular order other than it's the first one on your rules card. So we're going to jump around today. Um, but bear with me here. Admiral of course conditions. First of all, you have to know what that is. In the rules of law, in the back of the book, or on the app, you can go to the definition, se definition section towards the back. You're going to find what I would call a walk tree. Some of you are perhaps, or maybe current school teachers, that walk tree, like where the kids go to find the definitions of things. Um, that's the same thing in the rule of golf. And if you read or study one part of the rules book, please make it back. You'll find a lot of answers to your questions in there. But here we have the definition of an abnormal course condition. It tells you it's one of four things. The animal hole underlined and in a different color because there's also a definition for that. <laughs> um, ground under repair. Again, there's also a definition for that. It includes a lot of different things. So interpreting the rules is kind of like an onion. You get to one layer and then you just have to keep going because there's all these definitions. And honestly, when you get into these blue definitions, you're probably going to find other definitions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really interconnected. But anyway, abnormal course conditions, animal holes, ground under repair, immovable obstructions, and temporary water. Okay. Um, we're going to watch a video here that shows you the relief procedure for this, and then we'll give you some additional information. If you want to play your ball of lives, go right away, but you are allowed to take the beach without help. First, you need to determine the nearest spot, no closer to the ball, where the abnormal force condition is no longer in play. It's possible to mark that spot with a team. Then, Determine the area within one club length, no closer to the hole. Drop your ball and play on. All right, thanks to the USGA for producing these really great videos for us. So here's what you need to know about that in more detail. You have interference from an abnormal force condition when your ball touches or is in or on that abnormal force condition when you're in the general area. Okay. It has to physically interfere with your area of stance or intended swing. Okay, it has to physically interfere. Saying I'm distracted by that because it's in front of me is not good enough. It has to physically interfere. <laughs> um, I, I wish that was the rule, but it's not. Uh, and only when the ball is on the putting green can you have free, free relief from an abnormal force condition that's on your line of play. Okay, so you're 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 in front of the green, there's a big puddle about I don't know five yards in front of you, and you were really hopeful that you could play a bump and round shot up to the green. That water's in your way. If it doesn't physically interfere with your stance or your swing, you're not going to get free relief from that under this rule. Okay. Um, same thing, those green pesky green electric boxes that are out there. Okay, if that just interferes with your line of play and your ball's not on the putting green, you're not going to be able to leave from that. 
And this is a screenshot of a definition of support for the word taking relief. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I'm not going to read it to you. That's boring. But Mir's point of complete, complete relief is a very important concept, and we can honestly do an hour seminar on that by itself. But here's what I'll highlight. Um, when you're taking relief and you're finding your nearest point of complete relief, you have to take complete relief, right? Where there's no interference from the condition that you're taking relief from, okay? I'll give you an example of that here in a second. The second thing is when you're measuring and when you're trying to find that nearest point of complete relief, um, finding that reference point, you should do that with the club that you would be using. Okay, so if you're gonna hit an eight iron from wherever you're taking relief, um, finding that nearest point of relief, you're going to use that eight iron to do that. Um, just the best practice in this space. So here we go again, this is right from your book. Okay, step one, we're in the general area, so we're good to take free relief from this abnormal course position. Step two, we need to find our reference point, which we just talked about is the nearest point of complete relief. In this case, we get one club length in any direction to create our relief area, which is this little brown section here. We're gonna drop the ball in that. We're gonna make sure when we drop it, it lands in that area and it stays in that. We're gonna do that from the height. And voila, you're good to go. Free relief, no issue, okay? Again, this is highlighting, it has to be complete relief. So even if you get your ball out of the condition, but you're still standing in it or your swing is going to go through it, you haven't taken proper relief. You have to get all the way out there. So this is a cart path. And the good news here is if you know how to take relief from a cart path, because it's an abnormal course condition, you also know what to do for spring run heads. You also know what to do for animal holes and temporary water. So here we have a right-handed player who's playing up the screen. Okay, so the hole is up here somewhere. We're looking at ball one, the ball on the path. First question, does that golfer have to take relief? No, it's optional. Great. If they do want to take relief, what's the first thing they need to do? Find there. Perfect. So we have to determine what's nearest. Obviously, going behind us in this case is not um, considered. So we're either going to the right or to the left. Which line is nearer? The blue. So from there, we have our reference point, our one club length relief area. We're going to drop in there and we're going to move on. Okay. Now we have a ball that's off the path, but we're standing on the path. Does the player have to take relief? Can the player take relief? Okay, so they decide they want to take relief. We need to take complete relief. So in finding the reference point, we have to make sure we're going to get our feet off the path. Which way is nearer? To the right. So there we go. We've established our reference point. We have our one full length relief area. So same path. But depending on where that ball is, or depending on if you're a right-handed or left-handed player, you could be on opposite sides of the path when you take relief. I just want to highlight <laughs> what we just talked about doesn't change when there's some junk over there. Did Kendall do this artwork? Or? <laughs> yeah, she's an advanced artist. She, she helped me out. <laughs> Um, it, it doesn't change, so we like to say it's not the nearest point, but it's the, uh, I'm sorry, it's it is the nearest point. It's not the nicest point. You, it's not a choose me. You don't get to pick and choose. It's all about where that nearest point of complete relief really is. Do we got it? All right. There's an option that might be in play at your league events for a model local rule. Anytime you see a model local rule, you have to be really careful. It's not necessarily in the rules of golf, so it's not automatically in play, but your league or your club or the CJ tournaments or whomever might put this into effect. When they hand you that really long local rule sheet that you don't want to read, um, it's important that you do, because you may have some things that you can do that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Sometimes we have a move of structures that are close to the running green, and what we really mean by that is there's a sprinkler in your way, and you're wanting to cut that ball. So earlier I told you you can't take line of play relief unless your ball was on the cutting green. Now I'm telling you this local rule is in play and there's a sprinkler in your way. There's You can, but with these restrictions. Uh, you have, okay, he talks about this. Nice, nice. Here's the diagram. And some people ask me if this is a sand green. Um, if it can be, it doesn't have to be. That's just something I call the gospel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. So the two requirements, the sprinkler head or the 
obstruction has to be within two code lengths of the cutting grain. In this case, is the removal obstruction within two code lengths of the cutting grain? Okay, great. Now we can move on to the second question. The second part of this is, is the ball within two code lengths of the sprinkler bed? Okay, if the answer is yes and yes, congratulations, you get free relief. You're going to use the same procedure we just talked about to do that. Okay, if the answer to either of those questions is no, sorry, you're probably going to have to chip it or choose a different route. Okay. Okay, more. Ashley, welcome, Kate. Sure. Can I ask a quick question? Ooh. At the end, write it down and find us at the end. Because <laughs> I'm already way over my allocated time. <laughs> uh, I know we'd all love to hit them all straight, but obviously that doesn't happen all the time. But a lot of when you snap hook it towards those out of bounds, like fences or towards a public road, or you know, you down in the middle of the you know, shank it right into the long vest tube. But we do have some options here for, well, technically, what I'm so when is a ball out of bounds? A ball that rests out of bounds only when all of it is outside the boundary edge of the course. What's important here is that all of it must be out of bounds. So if there's a slither of that ball touching the inside, inside that course boundary, your ball is in bounds, okay? What about a lost ball? I'm sure we've all played with someone that said, hey, Ash, you know, I've been towards the best you. That, I'm just declaring that ball lost, okay? I'm just declaring that ball lost. Can the player technically declare a ball lost? No. <laughs> that declaration means nothing. There is one way for a ball to become lost. So the lost definition right here, the status of a ball that is not found in the three minutes after the player or their caddy begins to search for it. So that three minute timer must go off for that ball to become lost. If the ball is lost or out of bounds, we only have one option to proceed under, and that's all our favorites, stroke and distance. And that is we're going to play a ball from where we've previously, where we've previously made a stroke run. We're going to add one stroke. Um, but obviously, we have some things that can help us, which is a provisional ball. Hopefully, you all tell all of your ladies in your league about this option with their newbies. It can save time, it can save face. There's nothing funner than walking back and seeing that group behind you, watching you re tee or watching you re in the middle of the bed. Um, so, yeah, let's get those provisional balls going this year. When can we use provisional? What do we have to do to get that provisional ball in place? So, if a ball might be lost outside a penalty area or is out of bounds to save time, the player may play another ball provisionally under penalty of stroke and distance. Important here, outside a penalty area. So if you are virtually certain that your ball is in or could be in a penalty area, you see it go in there. You play this golf course all the time. It goes over a hill. There's a red penalty area there. It couldn't be lost anywhere else outside of that penalty area. You cannot get a provisional ball. You must proceed on a penalty area relief when you're certain it's in that penalty area. The player must announce that they are going to play a provisional ball before they do so. It's not enough to just say, I'm going to reload. I'm sure instead you're all saying, I'm going to proceed under 18.3. <laughs> so if you clearly do not announce that you are playing a provisional ball and you go ahead and make that stroke, that ball is automatically in play. So you just put another ball in play. You're going to add that one penalty stroke and you're hitting three. The provisional ball, there's a lot of things that happen with this when it becomes in play, when we must abandon them. We're going to get to some diagrams here in a minute that explain all of this. The provisional ball can be played more than once and keeps its status when played from the same distance or farther from the hole than where the original ball is estimated to be. So I can look at this in the diagram, but I tee off into the woods, think I want to get a provisional, maybe lost outside of the air. I'm like, hey, I'm going to get a provisional. I then proceed to duck that off the tee about 50 yards. I probably hit my first ride at least 275. <laughs> um, I have not gotten near the hole yet. So I can continue to play that provisional ball. And a lot of people don't understand that, I think. So if you keep that provisional ball shorter than where you think your original ball is, keep playing that provisional ball up until where you think your original ball is. And then we have a bit of a treat. 
The provisional ball becomes the player's ball in play under penalty of stroke and distance when the original ball is lost anywhere except in a penalty area or is out of bounds. So we find our ball over that fence or we've taken our three minute search time. That provisional ball then becomes the ball in play. That original ball is now a wrong ball. Or when the provisional ball is played from a spot nearer than near the hole than where the original ball is estimated to be. So two reasons there when a uh, play the provisional comes in play. And then we have some instances when the provisional ball must be abandoned. And in, in these two cases, when we must abandon the provisional ball, when we find our original ball on the course. It's not in a penalty area, and our three minute search time has an end, so we just find our ball in the woods. That is the reason we would have to abandon that original ball. And when the original ball is found in a penalty area, or it's known or virtually certain that it can only be in that penalty area, we have to abandon that provisional ball and we must proceed on a penalty area relief. So, this is just a diagram of what we just chatted about, all of these things. So, teeing off. Got the snap hooks going, got it going into the trees over there. I clearly announced to my fellow competitors that I'm gonna play a provisional ball. I'm gonna play that provisional ball, dump it off the tee down the middle though. That's nice. We're at point A here. So that point A is not near the hole right than where I think my original ball could be. I can continue to play that provisional ball from point A. What is the purpose of this is to save time, right? We don't want to walk all the way down to where we think it is and then come all the way back. We can continue to play this ball. Once we hit our original ball from A, we can go over, start looking for our original ball, see if we find it, if we don't. So point B, which is where our original ball, we hit it to, that point B is now closer to the hole than where we thought our original ball is. So if I go and hit my provisional ball now, that's one of those reasons you remember when our provisional ball becomes a ball in play because we play that from near the hole than where we have straight out. So remember I said you can't declare a ball lost? You can get sneaky though if you know the rules, right? So you hit your provisional ball, hey, hey Ash, I don't want you to go look for my original ball. Don't even worry about it. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna play my provisional ball from closer to the hole. That ball is now in play, and my original ball in the trees, it's lost. In stroke play, hopefully your opponents, uh, your fellow competitors are nice, and they wouldn't just go and look for your ball out of spite. Match play, different story. <laughs> <laughs> model local rule. Actually, just talk about model local rules. This is optional. This is something that leagues are doing. Um, there is, it was put in in 2019. It is great for general play. We do not suggest this for highly competitive play. This is not in effect at any CGA championships. So for general league play, fantastic, put it in. It's to save time and that walk back to the group behind you. So hopefully you've seen this over the last four years. Maybe your league has been in effect already, but this is something that your league has to put in, okay? You should tell your ladies that this is in effect, because like I said, not every course has this in and not every competition has this in. So make sure you're looking for this to see if it is in play or not. So it's going to allow a committee to provide an alternate relief option for a ball that is out of bounds or cannot be found. It's purpose to save time, help pace the play as it allows the player to play on without returning to the location of the previous stroke. Here's a great video. When your ball is lost or out of bounds, your course can use a local rule that does not require you to play under stroke and distance. Here's how it works. For two penalty strokes, estimate where you think your original ball is lost or where it went out of bounds. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through that estimated point. Next, estimate the point on the nearest edge of the fairway that is not nearer the hole. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through that estimated point. The relief area where you can drop and play your ball for two penalty strokes will be quite large, anywhere as much as two club lengths outside of the two lines and between them, but not nearer the hole than the spot where you estimated your original ball was lost or went out of bounds. 
you cannot use this local rule if your ball is lost in a penalty area or if you have played a provisional ball back. Thank you. All right, here's a great diagram of this. This is also um, in the app or in the book. The most important thing you need to remember is that this is stinging us too, because it's the, the thinking is that we're not going all the way back. So we're, you know, we'd normally be T to say this is not the T shot, we'd normally be playing three off the T, getting down to whereabouts we wouldn't be and we'd be hitting four. So it's just you're just kind of gating the same gating the same elements here. So important thing to note is you can borrow talking about reference points. There is two reference points in this model overall. The two reference points that we have is point A, which is the ball reference point. So where we estimate this is what we're at ball is likely lost. This is a lost um, diagram example. We're then going to look at what our second reference point is, which is point B, which is the fairway reference point which is the estimated uh, nearest fairway edge that's not near the hole to where the ball is estimated to be. From those two points, we're gonna get this very large relief area. And so like they said, we're gonna go from the hole, we're gonna take the line back through point A, we're gonna take the line back from the hole through point B, and we're going to add two club lengths to the outside of that line. So that fairway edge, those two club lengths, it's gonna get you into the short stop. Right, so we're going to get onto the fairway there. So definitely remember that that two club add will um, potentially get you out if you're going on that right side in this example into the fairway. This is an example of an out of bounds situation. So this girl has hit it from the fairway. She's airmailed the green and gone over a boundary edge. So in this case, point A is going to change a little bit. We're going to be estimating where the ball last like, would have crossed the edge of the out of bounds. So we're going to use that point where it crossed the out of bounds. We're going to find our nearest fairway, fairway edge that's not close to the hole. We're going to get that hole area there. What's important here, though, is that this relief area, it must be in the general area. So you'll see at point B, we have that additional two club lengths on the outside. But at point A, we can't get those additional club lengths on the outside because it's out of bounds. We're no longer in the general area. We're off the course. So you'll see on the A, you don't have those extra two club lengths and you to go that way. Why can't we use these two spots as our fairway reference point? Remember, we can't be near the hole. So point A and point B there, they're equal distance from the hole, whereas these two other points, that's nearer the hole. Right, That's a lot. Kate just killed it. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> um, I'm sure you have more questions than answers, but that's okay. Um, Lewis and Ryan are happy to answer those after our, our presentation. <laughs> so, um, again, balls move on the golf course. Um, balls move because we hit them. That's great. Balls also move because something happened that we didn't want to happen. Um, we don't have time to cover hardly this, but really all of those situations. So, this is the one that's on the rules part, which is why we've chosen this one. What happens when your ball moves while you're looking for it? You're out in the fescue, or someone else is out in the tall grass, or whatever. You're in the act of looking for the golf ball. Uh, there is no penalty if you accidentally, if your ball is accidentally moved when you're trying to find it, okay, or make sure it's yours. Okay. Um, when this happens, you have to replace your ball where it was. And it's not dropping, it's replacing in this case. Okay. Again, there are lots of things. Just okay. When you do this, in the act of searching, there's no penalty. Yes? If you move your ball in the general area any other time, then you're not searching, you're going to be in a penalty situation, depending on a lot of different things. Keep that in mind. Not going to go any further than that. We're going to move on. Okay. Embedded balls. Again, this is on your card. Um, the definition of an embedded ball is pretty important here. Um, it's when your ball is embedded in its own pitch mark as a result of your previous stroke and part of your ball is below ground level. So there's a there's more to this diagram that I find in the app, but there's a photo or a picture, a diagram of what an embedded ball might look like. Um, something that I just want to highlight, your ball has to be airborne and then come down and embed in that way. So if you drive it into the ground because 
I don't know, and it's wet and it's mushy and it just, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. You're looking at me like that's never happened to you. That's happened to me. <laughs> um, if that happens, that's not an embedded ball. You're going to have to proceed under a different relief procedure for that. So an embedded ball it has to be as a result of the pitch mark made from your previous stroke. So where that this happens, it has to be super wet, super mushy. Um, it's also not embedded if it gets stepped on or, or rolled over by a maintenance vehicle. That's a different rule. Um, so this is kind of in a niche situation here. Here's how you would take relief in that situation. Again, we're having a reference point. This looks familiar to what I talked about earlier with that course conditions, but we're not having the near complete relief when you're proceeding under Rule 16 for embedded ball relief. You're actually fine using the point for the spot right behind where the ball is embedded. And it's one of few, if not maybe the only rule where this is the reference point. Um, so we want to call that out because it is a little different. Again, you're going to get your one equivalent area there where you can take relief. This is only true in the general area. Okay, you cannot take embedded ball relief in a penalty area um, or, or in a bunker. Okay. On your rule sheet, there is a section about embedded ball that is highlighting a change. Um, this is pretty uncommon, but basically in the past, if your ball was embedded in the lip of a bunker, that was technically embedded in the general area. And when you had this reference spot was the spot right behind that, there was a chance that you were only in the bunker. So you part of your relief area wasn't even in the general area. So you didn't even get relief in that situation. And the USGA and the RNA advisory were like, hmm, that's not very fair. So they did make a change to that. Um, it's pretty, it's laid out here. But now we're we're basically ensuring that you'll have a place to drop that embedded ball so when you're taking a leak from there. Find the way back, but I'll explain more about that. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go fast. Okay, loose impediments, anything natural, unattached, stones, pine cones, insects, branches that are loose and unattached. Um, dead rats, leaves, bananas. Okay. Um, if the rat's alive, it's an animal, but then when it dies, it gets a different status of a loose impediment. Um, okay. Long story short here, um, you can move loose impediments anywhere on the golf course in any way you choose. Brush it with your hand, kick it with your foot, pick it up with your hand. We don't care. Get it out of your way. Um, but watch this because there is a risk involved. You're doing it. Natural object makes things more difficult than necessary. Fortunately, it's also not to be reduced without the even in buffers and kind of scares you But there is an element of risk involved. If you have this impediment causes a fault here, you must replace it and add one penalty stroke to the and let it happen on the where there is no cause. <laughs> Okay, so you can move it, but it's risky. Okay, if you move it and you move your ball, how many penalty strokes are you going to gain? Right. One. And you need to put your ball back where it was. I don't care if it's a fraction of the fraction. Put it back. Okay. If you don't put it back, um, you're actually going to end up playing from the wrong place, which would be two penalty strokes in most cases. So just put it back and okay? save yourself the second bout of agony. Okay? You gotta move them, but don't move your ball. Great news, movable obstructionists. Move them, but this time there's really no risk. Okay, movable obstructions are anything artificial. So loose impediments were natural, movable obstructions are artificial. Teas, grapes, um, water bottles, score cards, the leftover birdie juice cups that someone has come to feel that on the ground. Again, without penalty, you can move those things anywhere on our course, and you can do so in any way. Watch this video. These obstacles can be the object of way anywhere, even in the other While not required, it's okay to get more of the ball the whole structure. If the ball moves, there is no penalty. Just simply replace it and play on. Oh, great. So the common question there, no penalty, what if back? You should mark it, you don't have to. There are some must mark situations in the rules of golf. This is not one of them, okay? But just do it, then you don't have to worry about the concern, the concern. Um, that's movable instructions. The common question is, 
We're on a bunker, right? The rake is positioned in the bunker, and if I move that rake, my ball is going to roll away down into the face of the bunker. Okay, we're going to put it back where it was. Well, it's not going to stay because the bunker is sloped, right? You're going to keep placing it as near as you can to where it was until it stays in the bunker. You're not going to get a freebie here. You're not going to have to go out of the bunker. But you're just going to keep placing that no push to pull as near as you possibly can to where it stays. Got it. Cool. Another change on that one page. Uh, I feel like back on the line has been doing some back and forth the last couple of revisions. I feel like we're now back to closer to what we were doing in pre 2019. So this is definitely worth a look. Get this into your ladies' hands because this is a change on the back of the line relief. Let's watch this great new video. The rules of golf are changing in 2023. The back on the line relief procedure has been simplified, and here's what it looks like. So to use a penalty area as an example, I'm going to keep the point from the ball last cross between the hole and where I want to drop it. I can go back as far as I want on the line, but I have to drop it on the line because that's what activates the disc relief box. If I don't drop it on the line, I'll be dropping it the wrong way. The relief area won't get created, and I'll have to correct my mistake by dropping it again, but in the right way on the line. But once dropped on the line, the ball can roll up to one club length in any direction, even if it rolls forward forward and closer to the hole. Back on the line is a great relief option for penalty areas, but you can also use it when you decide that your ball is unplayable. This guy's awesome. USGA is obsessed with him. I think he's doing a great <laughs> job. Get on their YouTube, get on their Instagram. Watch the movie stuff. So two big things in 2023 for this. The ball must be dropped on the line to activate this relief area. And secondly, we now have one club length in any direction. So you've seen most of the relief areas that Act has been talking about, they have been no nearer the hole. This relief area is a circle, and we can go forward like you said in the video. Um, back on the line relief, we can use this for penalty areas, unplayable, which we're gonna get into here. We got some videos that were made in 2019. The back of the line relief is still 2019. USGA slacking, not redoing all their videos yet, but just be aware, black it out. What do you have to do? Just try and uh, we'll try and see if we can see the incorrect in some of these videos coming up here at back on the line. All right, penalty areas definition: any body of water on the course, whether or not marked by the committee, including a sea, lake, pond, river, surface, drainage ditch, or other water course, even if not containing water, and any other part of the course the committee defines as a penalty area. We know we can define these as red or yellow. We have to be virtually certain that we are in one of these to take relief. We can always play our ball as it lies instead of taking relief in the penalty area. Lots of good things here. So remember, black is back on the line. Penalty areas include any body of water on the course plus any other areas that have been marked. If you happen to find your ball in a penalty area, you can play the ball as it lies, if possible to do so. Before playing the stroke, it's okay to ground your club, take practice wings that touch the ground, and move loose in pedals. Penalty areas can be marked either red or yellow. And for one penalty stroke, you have several relief options. The first one is to play a ball under stroke at distance from where you made your last stroke. Another option is to take back on the line of lead by imagining a straight line from the hole to the spot where your ball last crossed into the penalty area. She's dropping it on the line, the line and that's around circle. Right in direction. Club length of it, not near the hole. You do have a third relief option if your ball is in a red penalty area that allows you to find the spot where your ball last crossed into the penalty area and drop the ball within two club lengths of that spot, no closer to the hole. Also, there may be an area marked as a drop zone that could be available as an additional option. Drop zones, drop zones are fun. Line of flight. I think we already mentioned this. This does not exist in the rules, folks. Line of flight. You may have a lady that just like, I'm sweeping this in off this right hook, off this dog leg, but my ball is like way up near the, near the green. I can see it sitting there. That's where I'm going to take my relief from, right? It was flying in this way. No, we are focused on where that ball last crossed the margin of the has uh, the penalty area. So we're going to last cross the edge. That's fine. 
So it hasn't <laughs> um, last crossed the edge. So we're not worried about line of flight. We're worried about where it last crossed. Here are our options for red. These are the majority of our uh, penalty areas out there now, most commonly marked this way. They give us three options. We always have stroke in the distance. We can always go back to where we last played from. We have back on the line relief where we're going to take the hole. We're going to take point X, which is where that ball last crossed the edge of the penalty area. We're going to go back on the line as far back as we want. We're going to drop on that line and we can have that full circle we can roll forward for our relief area there. So we have those three options for red. Yellow, less. I've hardly seen any of these anymore. These are more about having a player navigate the penalty area. You will find these mostly marked yellow when it's like a pond in front of a car three. You want the challenge of that player getting over and carrying that. We only get two options with yellow. Always can go back, stroke a distance. And then we have back on the line, relief with this one. You know, you girls that have the high spin rate, we get on the putting green, spin it back in off that slope. So the last place it's crossed is technically on that green side. But remember, for yellow, we only have these two options. We have to go back on the line from where it last crossed. So yes, we may be on that other side. We have to go back because we have to navigate this penalty area. The challenge of this is to get over. So we're never going to be dropping for yellow on the green side. There's no option. We don't have a lateral relief option for this. Unplayable, same options here. Uh, three, the three different types here. Uh, a player. Only person that can declare their ball unplayable. We can only, um, we can take this anywhere except for in a penalty area. Remember, that ball's in a penalty area. We only have those penalty area relief options. So unplayable anywhere else other than a penalty area. And we have three relief options, like I said, all for a one stroke penalty. Well, the receiver ball is definitely it's impossible or difficult to play from. Only you can decide the ball is unplayable. You can make that decision anywhere on the course except for one when your ball is in the penalty area, where the penalty area rule applies. When deciding the ball is unplayable, you have three relief options, but all come with a one stroke penalty. The most frequently used option to drop within two club lengths of the ball, but no closer to the hole. The second option is to imagine a straight line from the hole through the location of the unplayable ball. Choose a spot on that line behind your ball, then drop the play within one club She's length dropping the off the line. The hole. <laughs> which means you should go back to the spot where you last played. There is a fourth option that only applies when you decide the ball is unplayable in a bunker. More on that in the video about bunkers. I think the, the a lot of players just go directly to wanting to take lateral relief in this situation, especially a lot of beginners. You may see this in your linear and dense trees, and you just see a player just automatically start pulling out their two bubblings to try to get out of there. Sometimes that does not get you out of the jump and you have to take an additional two clog lengths to get further out. Giving rules information is not giving advice unless you are steering them in a certain direction. So telling a playing, uh, someone in your group, you have three options. Let me tell you what they are. Because you can always go back on the line and you can always play under stroke and distance, okay? So sometimes that lateral leap will not get you out. So just something to think about there. Um, the main thing here is if you do wish to take lateral or back on the line relief really for unplayable, is that you must have found your original ball. You must know where that ball is, because remember, we're using the spot of that original ball as the reference point in lateral and as the line that we're taking back to take back on the line. So if you cannot find your ball, you can't identify it in this bush, your only option, stroke and distance, you're putting your ball on a stroke and distance. So to use these other two options, you must find your ball. We always we can play bunker shot like Jennifer Puffer, let me tell you. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they're pesky, can't get out. If you never want to play out of a bunker again in your life, you do not have to anymore. Okay? <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> so we have an additional option when your ball is in a bunker for unplayable, and that is a two-stroke penalty 
and you can get out of the bunker. Just for one stroke, the one stroke options that we've just talked about, lateral or back on the line, they must remain in the bunker, okay? If you're always in the bunker and you're taking either lateral or back on the line, you must remain in the bunker. Obviously, stroke distance is always an option, but for two strokes, come on out, back on the line. If you hate that bunker on number seven, you don't have to play, <laughs> but it's not one back. <laughs> All right, a couple of muskrats. There are numerous muskrats in the book. We're just gonna focus on two here. Two most common ones here. So you hit a wrong ball. If a wrong ball is played, the player must correct. If you do not correct this mistake in time, you are going to Dairy Queen, you're getting a card, but you're going to DQ Town. Okay? <laughs> the card may make you feel better. What is an example of a wrong ball? Another player's ball in play. So Ashley's ball sitting there in the fairway. Some gray ball, a random ball I found out there in the fairway. Or your own ball that is lost or out of bounds. So I could be standing right here in my sideway ball outside the fence, it's out of bounds. That is a wrong ball. It is the general penalty if you hit that wrong ball. So in match play, it's just lost the ball. You don't need to fix it in match play. It's just between Ashley and I, I just lose that ball to her. General penalty in stroke play, you're going to get two strokes. And in stroke play, you must correct this before teeing off on the next hole, or if it's your final hole before putting a before you tear in your scorecard. Otherwise, like I said, off to DQ down the road. Another must correct is about teeing areas. Actually, chatted about the teeing area, that teeing area that you must start when you're playing playing a hole. You must play from anywhere inside that teeing area, and in stroke play. If a ball is played from outside that teeing area, including a wrong set of tee markers, or if you're just on a completely different hole that has happened at a tournament of mine, so I'm going to one instead of 10, something like that. Um, or for the final hole, this is a must correct as well. In straight play, you must correct this before teeing off the next hole, or if it's your last hole before returning your scorecard. You're going to get dinged two strokes for doing it as well. In match play, again, just between Ashley and I, I'm not going to get penalized for playing outside that teeing area, but she could recall my stroke and make me play that again. But if I uh, maybe struck it down the middle, she might cancel it on me. <laughs> and then this is kind of like an example. So we're playing from these yellow teeing areas, like we're playing from the yellow markers today. That is our teeing area that we should be playing in to start the sixth hole. That blue teeing area, that red teeing area, anything in front of the yellow or anything more than two kilometers behind, that is in you're playing outside of the tee area, you have not got a ball in play and stroke play, you must correct that. Does that make sense? Otherwise, again, head enough to DQ. Get a blizzard this time. Enjoy it. <laughs> I think we've gone over pace of play and blah, blah. Um, but yeah, pump up through this. The pace of play is so oh. good. So good. All right. That was fast and furious. We appreciate your attention. I'm sure you have lots of questions. I keep saying it, but I'm just going to say it one more time. Lewis and Brent will happily answer your question. And I do just want to take this chance to brag about our team for one hot second. Um, when you're on staff in the rules and competitions department at AGAs or state golf associations, which we are, USDA requires you to have one person on staff who's an expert in the rules of golf, which means you got a 90% on a 100 question exam. That's really hard. <laughs> It's four hours long, and if you would like to take that, um, come talk to me, but I really don't recommend it. <laughs> anyway, we have to take that. The USGA requires one person on staff to be an expert. Um, we have three experts and one advanced on staff, which is a huge accomplishment. So please round of applause for our team. If there's ever a, like a rule of golf jeopardy or like quiz bowl, um, we're in. So if you hear about that, <laughs> let, let us know. But here we are, looking for more education. Lewis and Brent are conducting four-hour seminars, again, much easier than what we just did. Um, they're conducting seminars across the state throughout the rest of the spring. Um, if you are not close to one of these locations or the dates aren't good for you, there's a virtual option. Join us in the evenings after work or whatever else you do during your day. Um, sign up for those. Thank you. Um, there's also just a lot of really good resources out there. PGA has rules videos, Ed and Lewis are primarily the stars of those, but Kate did make a cameo. Um, 
she's the best. They're the best. They're easy to understand. Those would be simple things to push out to the members of your team, um, especially if there's a particular situation that you're having trouble with or that really applies to your golf course. And then the USGA videos that we just showed you, we're hopeful that they're going to come out with some updated versions so we don't have to have faith that she's dropping on the line. Um, <laughs> although she did that very nicely. Um, we're hopeful that they'll get some of those updated. But if you go to the USG YouTube page in particular or just USGA.org, any video that's Looks like it was filmed in an iPhone because it probably was. Those are updated. And so the one we watched with Jay Roberts, those are great to send out to your lead. Those are incredible resources for you to use. If you're interested in learning more, the best way to do that, from my opinion, is to test your knowledge. There's a lot of resources out there that have quizzes. They range from beginner to intermediate to advanced knowledge. So you can kind of um, you know, select your skill level and answer those questions. Um, and again, there are some more seminars. So mm -hmm. lastly, a shameless plug to become a rules referee. Um, all of the folks, yeah. Put all of your hands right hand up, please. Please stand up if you appreciate Please stand up. Please stand up. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So if you want to, Jan, stand up for a second. If you want to get into this if you want to become a rules referee and you want to be in the game for 15 plus years please come and speak to jan and carla and sandy also get up there as well so maybe just be warned if you go talk to them you may be worked in for 10 plus and that advance to the expert level because no one starts there no we all start somewhere and it's really about um, coming out and getting experience. When you're talking to players on the golf course, um, what we really love is really great bedside manner. Um, instead of someone who can just recite, like, what's 18.3b slash 2 in the clarification? <laughs> okay. so we're not interested in that. So don't let that, uh, I mean, we are, but we aren't. So don't let that intimidate you. If you'd love to come out and be a part of our junior or our women's or our open events, um, please do that. Let us know. Talk to them. Talk we also have an apprentice program led by Sandy and Brad. Fantastic newbies coming out. We would love to have you. And you get to see our beautiful faces at the tournament. You get a free breakfast, maybe even a free lunch. We're going all out. You guys. Free shirt. And questions. Here's our expert to advance to you. Here we are. That's what we look like. Um, I'm quite excited to announce that we are under the matrix by three minutes. <laughs> so we are in getting lost. Perfect amount of time. Thank you all for the Thank you. Can we give these guys a big round of applause? Thank you, ladies. And you know how much hard work you put into that. And so they 